Habakkuk. I picked the most obscure book I could come up with, you know. <laughs> it's uh, one of the minor prophets. It's a few books after the book of Daniel, if you know where that is, towards the end of your Old Testament. And uh, if you guys recall, about two years ago, I got to teach here, and uh, we did Habakkuk chapter 2. So we're just continuing along at Habakkuk chapter 3. So if you recall the notes that you have from <laughs> Habakkuk 2, um, I, I say that just kidding around. But uh, Habakkuk is a great book in uh, perseverance and faith in the midst of trial. And so I went back to that book. I got to teach last weekend at another church, and so I did Habakkuk chapter 1. So got the trio, got one, two, and three in. Um, but the focus of chapter three, it's on praising God after the upsetting discussion that Habakkuk had with God in chapters one and two. And so I've titled this message, Praise Him Even When It Hurts, or Praise Him Even When You Don't Feel Like It. Uh, this is counterintuitive, but it's necessary for growth as a Christian. So with that, let's pray and we'll dive in the word. Father God, thank you for being everything, Lord. You are the creator. Lord, you, you are the universal God over everything, all of creation. Lord, you're also personal. You care about us. You know us individually. And you know what we deal with. You know with our hurts, what hurts we go through. Lord, you know uh, our joys. And Lord, you also have a purpose for each and every one of us. And so I just lift all that up today. I pray as we jump into your word, Lord, Habakkuk chapter 3, that you would show us each what you have for us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we come before you this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Start my timer here. Habakkuk. Chapter 3, we're just going to start with verses 1 and 2, and we'll do an intro. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so, just for starters, uh, just a couple things to get our feet under us. One, one thing we notice right away, he says, a prayer of Habakkuk. So this chapter, we're starting off, he, he notes that it's a prayer. And it says, he's a prophet, and it says, on Shigianoth. That's a word that I'm sure all of us instantly know exactly what it means as soon as we read that. I'm joking. But uh, it's, it's a word that we only see in one other place in the Bible, Psalm 7. And scholars believe that that is a word that entails that this is a highly emotional poetic form. And so this chapter resembles more of a psalm. Uh, we'll also see the term Selah used three times in verse 3, 9, and 13, which indicates to pause to reflect on the verses before it. And then finally, a note at the end of this chapter, it says, for the choir director on stringed instruments, verse 19. That's just a way of those th things put together, this, the context. This is, a, this is a psalm. This is a poem. This is a prayer. Of, of praise to God. So that's where we're at. In verse 2, Habakkuk says that he has heard your speech and was afraid. And I like the way that the NASB puts it. It says, Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear. Uh, in chapters 1 and 2, Habakkuk reaches out to God and he gets his answer and he has heard this report. It's another way of maybe saying it like this. God's message has sunk in. Uh, Habakkuk has clarity in this message, but there was an injustice in the beginning of this chapter. Uh, the message, at this point, he's gotten past that. He's, un he's understood that there is this un injustice. And as we go forward into this chapter, uh, I just want everybody here to know that uh, God doesn't play down our injustices. Our injustices are real. It's not something that is just a, uh, oh well. And we're going to see as, as he goes through this chapter that God does care. But his starting point, he's past that. He's, the message has sunk in. Habakkuk knows the message at this point. He's clear and he fears God. Uh, he trembles at the fear of God's judgment. He fears the king of kings and what he is able to do. 
Uh, this is a healthy fear of God. Like in Proverbs 9.10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so we see this healthy fear of God with Habakkuk here. And it's interesting that we see that there's this fear, and there's also understanding, and they're sort of paired together here with Habakkuk and his praise. And so I think it's a good thing for us all to just have that healthy fear of God, uh, not in a way that drives us away from him, but in a way that just really makes us want to drive closer to God. And it helps us to have clarity and understanding. In verse 2, Habakkuk asks God to revive his work and to make it known because it previously seemed like God had been silent in the previous chapters. Habakkuk knew that he would bring about his work based on what he said in the last few chapters. You might be thinking, so what happened in the last few chapters? We're going to get to that. Um, in verse 3, finally Habakkuk asks God to remember mercy in his wrath, where he is calling on God to be God. That God would not just destroy everyone because that's what really what we deserve. So why is Habakkuk writing a highly emotional poetic song? Well, it's because of what happened in the, the previous chapters, as I previously mentioned. Uh, historically, what was happening in the time of, of this writing was right before the Babylonian exile. And that happened in 605 B.C., but the handful of years that led up to that Babylonian exile, Israel had fallen far from God. They had a king. Uh, we, th we believe, more than likely, that, that when Habakkuk was younger, there was a king by the name of King Hosiah. We don't know exactly the date, but this is generally what, what the scholars believe, is that he was out during the king, king Hosiah's reign, and King Hosiah was known as a good king. But there was this battle. The Babylonians were slowly taken over the Middle East, and they were slowly stampeding their way towards the West, and they slowly took over, at first, Assyria, who Assyria had domination uh, prior to Babylon, and then the, the Egyptian king meddled in, and he was going to be a, an ally of Assyria to try to push off Babylon, and so at that point, King Jehoiakim, I'm sorry, King Hosiah, the good king, he got, he meddled in, in those affairs, and he ended up being killed because of that, and then through a chain of events, uh, the next king that succeeded him was King Jehoiakim, and he was an evil king. And so Habakkuk essentially watched his nation, and this isn't any nation, this is Israel, the holy chosen ones. He saw his nations, his nation, going down the toilet spiritually. And so evil and corruption, that became the norm. Habakkuk saw it, he couldn't stand it, and as a prophet of God, he wouldn't stand for it. Something needed to be done. I'm sure you can probably all relate to some degree with that. And so I call chapter 1 the valley, chapter 2 is the climb, chapter 3 is the summit. Habakkuk's complaint we can see in, in chapter 1 verse 4, he says to God, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. Habakkuk's frustration had totally consumed him. Have you guys ever felt like that? God responds. In verses 5 and 6 it says, this is God speaking to Habakkuk. He says, Be utterly astounded, for indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans was Babylon. It was another name for the Babylonians. And so God says, Hey, Habakkuk, I'm going to raise up this nation, the Babylonians, and they're going to come in and they're going to take you guys out. And so that's the answer to Habakkuk's complaint. Um, He goes on and he says that he's going to use the Babylonians as judgment against the Jews. So the, the original complaint, just to recap, was that the Jews were falling away from God. And he says, Lord, would you please do something? And then the answer was, yeah, I'm going to raise up your next door neighbors and they're going to come in and wipe you guys out and take you into slavery. Um, you can imagine the frustration there. It seems like a strange and an unfair method of correction, right? You guys remember the old hand smack trick? You go to your dad or maybe your uncle and you say, hey, you know, I've got some pain. You know, my back hurts, dad. And he's like, okay, well, show me your hand. And you're like, okay, well, what's this got to do with it? So you stick your hand out there. I feel like I'm the only one who's, this has happened to me. <laughs> Anyways, and then you smack the top of your hand. You're like, ow, what was that for? He's like, do you still feel the back pain? No, my hand hurts. So, you know, in a way, you know, this is just the way I read this. You know, I'm thinking, God, you're using the Babylonians to judge you're good people, and it just, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And a lot of times in our own personal lives, you can come up with a time, I'm sure, where something happened in your life, maybe things went from bad to worse, 
and it just doesn't seem to make any sense. And that's what Habakkuk has gone through here. God continues to detail the evil and the wretched people that the Chaldeans are and the injustices that will occur as they sweep in. Habakkuk responds to God's response, and this is now a second complaint. He says in verse 13, and this is uh, in the ESV version, I like, I like how they write in uh, verse 13, it says, Why do you look idly at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? He looks at Israel, Habakkuk looks at Israel and says, yeah, we're, we're, we're messed up, but they're even way more messed up. Why are you going to use them? And so in this response, a couple of things we can pull from Habakkuk is that he, he dares to be honest and bold. Now, I would say that God appreciates, uh, appreciates it when we are honest and bold. Obviously, we want to be reverent towards the Lord, but he's honest and he's bold towards the Lord. He says, Lord, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense to me. Habakkuk couldn't help but to emphasize the seemingly upside-down nature of God's justice. So we went from, God, please do something about a legitimate gripe, to, you're going to do what? Why? And how is that even fair, right? That's kind of, so I just want to put yourself in Habakkuk's sandals. They didn't have shoes back then. Um, chapter 2, we kind of get into the climb. And so God responds to Habakkuk now for the second time. In verse 4 in chapter 2, this is an important verse. God says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And so God is shifting the focus from the physical to the spiritual. God is shifting the focus for Habakkuk from what is going on in his circumstances to who will fix it. From Judah and their local problems to the world at large, and God is the sovereign king. Perhaps you can relate to Habakkuk's problem Perhaps you haven't experienced an injustice before. I'd, say, I'd ask for a show of hands, but I know everybody's hand will go up in the air. Um, it could be political in nature. You feel as if there was an injustice. It could be um, that you just see that our moral decline in our country is occurring, and you just wish that wrongs would be righted. I know recently in the news we saw there was a Venezuelan election, and it seems to me like all of the facts point towards this was a, a, a rigged election and that the person claiming to win did not actually win. What about all those people who casted votes? What about them? What about, what about their voices not being heard? Does God care about that? What about the wars in the Ukraine and Israel right now? And are they justified? Is it fair for all those citizens caught in the crossfire? Here's one that's maybe closer to home. What about the rising inflation in your grocery store bill? Is it fair that you work so hard to earn that dollar to only watch it vaporize at, at the checkout counter? What about your relationship with that person? Maybe an injustice in your marriage or a wrong caused by a brother or sister even in Christ. So the list of injustices just goes on and on. It wasn't very hard to come up with a list of injustices. I think we can all do that. But friend, let's not forget Firstly, what, what do we truly deserve? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the word tells us that all are sinners. All of us fall short of the glory of God. So what do we really deserve? We actually deserve death. The fact that we even get to remain alive, to experience an injustice, that's the mercy of the Lord because we deserve it. We deserve the death. Habakkuk's perspective is actually what changed in chapters 1 and 2. It wasn't his circumstances. As we'll see, not only in the, in the Bible, but also in history, uh, Babylon did come in, and they did exile uh, Israel. They did, they did enslave them. Now, God continued to work his plan out, and God will always continue to do that, but our circumstances don't always turn favorable. The Babylonians were still coming in to take them. Israel still had death and destruction in her future, but God still had a higher purpose, God's sovereignty. Uh, Habakkuk went from woe is me to woe, can you do that? You can permit evil to, to, do a, to accomplish good. You can put your chosen people through the ringer to accomplish your good. You guys remember the story of Joseph when he said to his brothers, the ones that sold him into slavery um, to the Egyptians, Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God used for good. It is better for God to accomplish his plan, his way, which often includes unfairness and discipline. Yes, even for believers. The Christian walk is not all sunshine and, and 
rainbows or cupcakes and fairy tales. Don't believe the hype with the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. It's not biblically accurate. And if you don't know, I'm a retired Marine. There's an old recruiting poster. Uh, I love it, and it, it's fitting. It fits in right here. It, it says on the poster, we don't promise you a rose garden, I'm trying to recruit people into the Marines. That's probably a good recruiting poster for the Christian life. Some side effects of salvation may include trials, tribulation, persecution, mocking, and hardships. Ask your pastor if salvation is right for you. <laughs> Um, by the way, salvation is right for everybody. A true walk with the Lord brings bumps along the road, and when you experience these bumps, consider it an opportunity for gain. Jesus said that we will be hated for his sake. In John 15, he says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me first before it hated you. If you were of the world, and the world would love its own, yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Even the Apostle Paul, he eventually realized his sufferings for Jesus' sake. He, he, he realized that him suffering for Jesus' sake worked actually for his gain. Philippians 3, 8 through 10 says, Yet indeed... I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And Paul, as, as we believe from history, was actually executed for Jesus. Uh, he counted it all joy to suffer for Jesus' sake. Easy to say, hard to do. Um, but use your inevitable bumps in the road to grow your faith and maturity in your relationship with Jesus like Habakkuk does. And so we need to change our perspective like he did from local to large, from my small world to the whole world from self to sovereign, from my will to thy will, from worry to worship, from oh poor me to our God is an awesome God. Uh, look at injustices as an opportunity to be the salt and the light in the world filled with darkness. We need to be different from the world. Where there is unforgiveness, we need to forgive. Where there is ridicule, we need to have grace. And where there are lies, we need to have truth. Where there is hate, we need to be love. That's how you get from chapter 1, the valley, through chapter 2, the climb, as Habakkuk wrestles with these things to chapter 3, praising God from the mountaintop. And so I know that was a long background, but it's hard to take just one piece of this book without really looking at the other. So I just wanted to lead up into that. And so follow along with me. We're going to continue. We're going to read from verses 3 through 15. Verse 3. God came from Taman, the Holy One, from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there, was, and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O oh Lord, you were displeased with the rivers. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Verse 9. Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. Excuse me. At the light of your arrows they went, at the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indig indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck. Selah. 
you thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. And so in these verses, what we see is this is kind of the heart of Habakkuk's prayer of praise. And there's a lot of language here, if you didn't catch it, it's, and we're going to look into this, strongly reminiscent of the Exodus. He's looking back on the great time that the Lord really did a lot of work in the nation of Israel as they left Egypt when they ended up being out there in slavery. They went crossed through the Red Sea. They spent 40 years in the desert and eventually they crossed into the Promised Land across the Jordan. So in verse 3, we see God came from Taman and it says from Mount Paran. And those are two places that are associated with the Sinai Peninsula and which is where they spent the 40 years in the wilderness. In verse 3, he covered, his glory covered the heaven. And that could be a uh, language that is strongly reminiscent of the Shekinah glory. If you guys remember during that time in the desert, the Shekinah glory was that great fire, that pillar of smoke that filled the, the um, tabernacle. And they followed the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory, everywhere where it went. Verse 4, he had rays flashing from his hand, displaying his light. And his power was hidden, it said. It's kind of like the sun that if unrestrained, it would burn alive its beholders. That's the power of God. Verse 5, God's judgment precedes him as depicted here by pestilence and fever. This is a reminder of the judgment of God. As Jason even reminded us that there's that dual nature of God. And so Jesus isn't, he's not Barney Jesus. He's not just all love and, and sunshine and rainbows. There's a judgment. There's a, there's a uh, other side. There's a justice part of God. And so he carried that out with pestilence and fever, just as a reminder of the judgment of God. Well, we can recall that there's judgment for Israel's disobedience to the Mosaic Covenant and also upon Israel's enemies, like with the ten plagues of Egypt, if you guys remember that. But either way, what we see here is Habakkuk is praising God for what he has already done. I want to say that again. We see Habakkuk praising God for what he has already done. God's past performance is a prediction of his future success. How did Habakkuk know these things? Well, by the written word of God. Habakkuk recalls in verse 6 that nature itself is under the authority of God. It says that he measured the earth, the hills bowed, he is everlasting. Do you detect a big view of God here or a little view? And if you go back and you read in verse 1, Habakkuk was more concerned about the local nation of Judah, and he wasn't so concerned about the bigger picture. And so we've seen a change in his perspective from chapters 1 all the way to chapter 3, going from little to big of God. In verse 7, Habakkuk is reminded of his presence and terror against Cushan and Midian in the desert. God is power and will come as a storm on those who oppose him, which is what these two uh, nations represented here. In verse 8, a reference to the Red Sea crossing. Of course, God is not unhappy with the water. It says, O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Your anger against the rivers was your wrath against the sea. God's not angry at the water. His anger was caused by the people, and that's what caused the sea to split. God rode on his horses, his chariots of salvation. He did the work, not Moses, not Israel. In our lives, he does the work, not us. He remains faithful even when we are faithless. In verse 9, your bow was made ready, oaths sworn over your arrows. And that points towards God's wrath and how it is divinely commissioned and it will be executed effectively. God doesn't miss. Continuing in the next few verses, I see the creator God here as Habakkuk describes how God divided the earth with rivers and the power of God as the mountains trembled Water overflowed, and the water even obeys God as the deep lifted up its hands on high. As in praise to God, think of the parting of the Red Sea, just the water obeying God. And in verse 11, similarly, it says, The sun and the moon stood still, continuing to show that nature must obey God. This sounds at first like a metaphor. You say the sun and the moon stood still, okay. But if you recall, this is a real event. Joshua 10, it, uh, Joshua details this situation here when the earth 
when the sun and the moon did stand still, it says, Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Even the sun and the moon obey God. The water obeys God. Wow. So Habakkuk shifts now to the fulfillment of his promises, of, of God's promises to Israel. We'll see in verses 12, 13, and 14. In 12, he says, You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. So God trampled those who opposed his will. And he trampled those who opposed God's purpose with Israel. You don't want to get in front of God when he's working his work with somebody uh, in a bad way. In verse 13, he says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare the foundation to neck. This your anointed here is not used in the Old Testament of Israel, but rather probably speaking of the coming Messiah. And so we see, you know, in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, speaking of faith, it's, it's really a New Testament uh, rendition of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It's by faith that we're saved. It's not by works that we do. It's not by keeping the law. It's not by making God happy with whatever, whatever our actions are. It's by faith. And we see this uh, foreshadowing of, of Jesus Christ here uh, 600 years before he arrived on the scene for his first coming. But in, in verse 14, it says, You thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. I think a reference to God here crushing Pharaoh, and he will do the same thing to Babylon. He's saying, this is what I've done in the past, and this is what I'll do again. So God not only says, yes, I'm going to use Babylon to judge Israel, but he also says, I'm going to judge Babylon, and even more so for what they've done. So don't worry about it, Habakkuk. I'm not going to wipe all your people out. Uh, this is going to be something that Israel will survive and actually thrive from afterwards, but he will also judge Babylon for the world for the evil things that they're going to do. Habakkuk closes this stroll down memory lane with God. You were victorious then. You will be victorious now. I think we all need to hear that message in our own lives too. Instead of Habakkuk worrying as he was about what he didn't know, he started recalling what he did know. And that's what changed everything. His physical circumstances didn't change, but his spiritual circumstances did. God strengthened Habakkuk through his reliance on him, and he will do the same thing for us. The just shall live by faith. That's what we need to focus on. Habakkuk shifted from worrying about what was happening to who was in control. He stopped living by feelings, and he shifted to living by faith. This is the central message in Habakkuk, and I would say is really the central message of the Bible as a whole. Trust him, Jesus Christ not in yourself. Have you ever raised your hands in worship even when you didn't feel like it? Have you ever prayed to God even when you're upset at him for allowing a bad thing to happen in your life? Have you ever read your Bible even when it seems like the last 20 times you read it you didn't get anything from it? Well, I encourage you, believer, take the next step in faith if you haven't to praise God even when you don't feel like it, even when it hurts, because our faith is built on his truth Found in the word, not what we feel. God, uh, I'm sorry, Habakkuk closes with his action plan here and one that we should adopt for ourselves. So follow along with me as we read verses 16 through 19. Verse 16. When I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord 
God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. And so it's just a beautiful way to end this, this chapter in this book. As he started off with this injustice and he ends with praising the Lord. He doesn't understand things like clearly. He just understands the Lord's going to use it for his good in some way. And so we, st we see again in verse 16, he says, his body trembled, his lips quivered at the voice. It's scary stuff to have faith in the Lord and to just step out in, in that faith. It's, it's hard. But it is worth it though. Uh, it's scary when you know that you've got trials coming your way or maybe that you've got some divine discipline in your future. That's scary. In verse 17, this may be our circumstances. It says that the fig tree may not blossom. There might not be fruit on the vines. The labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock may be cut off from the fold, and there's no herd in the stalls. I mean, that sounds negative, 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 negative. But in verse 18, this is our faith. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will joy in the God of my salvation. We need to be like that. There's something really great about raising your hands in worship even when you don't feel like it. Or praying to the Lord earnestly even when you feel like maybe he brought some hardship into your life. Or cracking your Bible open even though maybe you don't understand everything every single, every single time you open it. But what is the result of our faith in verse 19? We see here... The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. This is a picture of sure victory. Isn't that what Habakkuk wanted from the beginning anyways? So what do we have to worry about? Uh, maybe you're worried about your personal calling. Maybe you've had a family member run out. Maybe you've been scammed. Maybe you've tried to do the right thing by God, only to have a church situation even hurt you. Whatever it may be, know this, it's chump, it's chump change for, for God, right? He has overcome, and he is overcoming. The word says in 1 John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that God has overcome the world, our faith. Not only were we born again by faith, but we also need to walk by faith. It's a daily thing. I challenge you to worship the Lord even when you don't feel like it, given your circumstances, as the just will live by faith. Why? Because he is sovereign. If you have not been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, by grace alone, through faith alone, you can make that choice today. And you can switch from one of the proud whose soul is not upright within him to one of the just who live by faith. We don't promise you a rose garden, and at times it might be scary, but it will be worth it. When you don't know what's going on in your life, don't focus on the circumstances. Rather, focus on the one. Jesus Christ, who is above all circumstances. Rely on what you do know, which is the word of God. And I encourage you all here today to praise him, even when it hurts. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, detailing history, Lord. We thank you for this book of Habakkuk. We thank you for showing us an example of walking from the valley that we've all experienced, and I'm sure we will experience valleys in our future, to the climb, and eventually we get to that summit, Lord, where we praise you, Lord, even when it hurts. It doesn't matter if we understand or not what we're going through, but we know that you're in control, and we just have faith in that, Lord. And so we just, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray for everybody here today that whatever word you had for us, that we heard it, Lord, and we apply it to our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for being so good to us, Lord, even when we don't deserve it. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.